Welcome, everyone. Thank you again for coming, even though it's the coveted last slot of the day. We will try to make it worth your time. Hi, can you hear me? Nope. Oh. It would really help if you actually turned on the mic, right? <laughs> All right. So um, first and foremost, I kind of wanted to say that, um, A, thank you to Molly, who did the art or the illustrate or the color work with her and her husband. I drew this. But also, um, this is definitely representative of a lot of teams and over a long period of time. So mad props to everyone that came before us. All right, my name is Kat Self. I used to be an artist. I still am an artist, apparently. Um, and I was formerly military involved. Yeah. It's always nervous speaking. Um, formerly, I served in the military, and I'm a military intelligence veteran, two years at war. Um, also, I started this career, though. This is actually my second career. So definitely proof point for those that wanted to transition from one thing that's totally unrelated to another. Um, I started off as a developer, then became a red teamer, and then became a um, threat hunter. And I was hired on to MITRE as an adversary engineer, where now I'm doing jobs I love, where I'm emulating adversaries, but I'm also the Mac OS and Linux lead for MITRE Attack. I'm Kate. Um, prior to joining MITRE, I worked at Facebook, now known as Meta. Uh, the majority of my career has spent been focusing on Latin America. So if anyone wants to talk Latin American adversaries or cyber groups in the region, let me know. And in addition to my work, I run a cybersecurity blog called Fishing for Answers, which is available in English and Spanish. OK, so we wanted to do some quick level setting before we really got into it and demonstrate what is an emulation and how is it different from adversary simulation. So we are fully leaning into the comic book references this presentation. Get ready. So as an adversary emulator, we have to take what Batgirl does, for instance, and be so convincing that it looks exactly as Batgirl would run an operation, right? There's not a lot of room for flexibility. Whereas if I'm a normal red teamer doing a simulation, I can take some things that Batgirl does, some things that Supergirl does, maybe another adversary, and mix the two. It's more of an approximation as the adversary. So there's more room for flexibility in a simulation. And so we're obviously going to focus on adversary emulation for this talk. Really quick, we use MITRE ATT&CK. I'm not going to go super into this because we're actually talking about attack evaluations, but we are based on MITRE ATT&CK. And the goal of this is to be threat-informed defense. Um, who here knows what attack evaluations is? OK. Oh, OK, that's good. Fun fact, uh, we actually have never done a talk before, like kind of detailing what like is going on on the inside of the development process for attack evaluation. So I just want to take a moment to explain that. Essentially, it's a like threat-based approach, right? So we're using MITRE attack, so we're locked into a specific adversary and specific techniques. So what we do is we take that information and then we release that to the public or the vendors, being like, "Hey, for all of those that do detection and protections, um, this is the actor that we're going to emulate." And these are the techniques that are going to be in scope for that emulation. And then we take around two, three months. We develop an emulation. And then they come in. They set up their tools in the environment. And then we execute our emulation. They have no idea what emulation we're going to execute. It's a black box task. And then we take all of those screenshots from watching the vendors be able to try to either protect or detect against them. And then we openly release that to the public. We don't filter it. We don't sit there and make it like fix things. It's just. Here is the data dump. Discern for yourselves what this vendor can really truly present to you. So the goal of the entire thing is to actually empower the users, is to be transparent. And these are billion dollar companies. We wanted to give you all a way to be able to peek inside of what these really expensive, amazing companies are doing. They each have these amazing, unique solutions that are solving a different problem. And not one size fits all in this case, right? Everyone has a different environment. Everyone has a different problem that they're trying to solve. We wanted to give you that information so you can discern for yourselves. So that's what attack evaluations tries to do. And we're going to go over how we essentially take a nation state actor, right, that has unlimited funding, that has 40 developers over five to six years, and we take all of that and we shove it into 10 developers and two to three months of development cycle, right? So we're taking a really hard task and trying to make it this approachable thing. 
And we've actually distilled this down even better, or hopefully more for you all, where in this emulation, we're actually gonna go over an adversary where we only had a month and a half to emulate, and we really only had two people on the project. We had one developer and one CTI person. So we've really tried to break this down to make this much more accessible for you all to be able to recreate it yourselves. Yeah, so even if you are all coming from smaller organizations, you might not have a whole adversary emulation department. One of our key takeaways for this presentation is to hopefully demonstrate a methodology that you all can use for yourself and distill down to whatever the resources you have realistically for creating your own emulations. Okay, so this is a graphic that we'll probably come back to uh, multiple times through the presentation, but it shows an overview of our process, right? I will start talking through adversary selection, how you do your research, how you create a scenario for emulation, and then I will pass it over to Kat, who will talk about the development side, building the tools, what does that look like, all the troubleshooting, and then we will show you how we actually executed our emulation. Um, so this is kind of designed to show the collaborative process between CTI and Red Dev for the purposes of emulation. Okay, so choosing your villain. Before you even get to adversary selection, it's really, really important to think about your end objective for the emulation, right? Why are you doing this? What insights are you hoping to glean from doing the emulation versus just a simulation, which we talked about the differences at the beginning, right? Um, how are you hoping this emulation informs your network defense capabilities? Think about that before you start anything else. Once you have that conversation, then it's time to choose your villain. These are some kind of main points that we ask ourselves on attack evaluations when it comes to selecting an adversary, right? Is there sufficient open source recent reporting on this adversary? Recent meaning within the last two years because on attack evaluations, everything is open source, so that's a limitation that we have to consider. Is the adversary and their TTPs relevant to what you're trying to achieve, right? Relevancy can also mean, can your network defenders detect on these techniques, right? Um, so that's really important to consider. Third, is there enough variety of adversarial TTPs to create multiple emulation plans? As we're gonna demonstrate later today, Sometimes adversary emulation, you have to pivot halfway through, scrap your whole scenario, and start new, right? So it's really important that you have enough content, that the adversary has enough uh, operations and variety of techniques to create multiple scenarios just in case you need a backup. And then finally, my favorite question, what's cool about this villain? Why should we care about them? What makes them unique? What makes them special? So our villain for today is Blind Eagle. This is the villain that we chose and chose to emulate, um, and we have a little bit of a video at the end that will show our execution as this adversary. So why did we choose this villain? I bullied Kat into choosing a Latin American adversary, basically is what happened. Um, <laughs> but in reality, um, this is probably an adversary that we would never realistically use for attack evaluations. Um, like Kat said, we only had a month and a half to dev this adversary, um, and so we needed kind of an adversary with more straightforward TTPs, but that are still highly relevant, right? Just because this adversary is not doing bleeding ed edge things in kernel mode doesn't mean they're not relevant to every single network defender. These are techniques that we would expect every network to defender, defender to detect on. Um, so these three techniques that I've listed at the bottom of the slide, those are the techniques that we prioritized when we turn to deving um, our emulation plan as Blind Eagle. That's essentially, going back to our conversation, what's unique about this actor, these are three main like MVPs that were really important to us. Okay, so we have our villain, let's talk about gathering the research. I think that one of the things that really kind of distinguishes our process is the level of technical depth that we need from reporting, right? The more technically in depth, the more information, the better that we can emulate and act as the adversary. Um, so these are some of the things, you know, we have explicit examples, you know, technical bits of information that are nice to have, and then implicit, right? If we get any of these implicit items, that is just gold, that is your MVP, really, really helpful. So I'll show you an example of this. 
So this is an example of a graphic that we pulled from a report on a recent Blind Eagle campaign. Um, we would consider this to be an explicit piece of evidence. And this shows an overview of the entire infection chain of the campaign, right? At every single step of the attack. Uh, some key bits of information to call out here that really helped our team. They have process names, file names, file types, uh, obviously full infection chain, port numbers used for C2 communications, uh, user level permissions. So this is a piece of di this is a diagram that we referred back to multiple times, both on the CTI and dev side when we were running this emulation. Actually, another point with that as well is that it might be like, oh, file names, whatever, I don't care. But when you're linking a bunch of different reports, those file names become very relevant, right? Like those same DLLs are also used over here in this campaign. And like, so now I'm like, okay, they're downloading this file that actually helps me because it actually never touched disk. So where am I gonna be able to file and pull that file and find it? And I can now link to another report to be able to create that connection that I didn't previously have before. Totally, and that kind of hits back to our conversation on adversary emulation versus simulation, right? Like we are really trying to be indistinguishable from Blind Eagle and how they would realistically do things. So these are two snippets from a report that we would be considered implicit evidence. Um, just as an example, if you look on the image on the bottom, these were both taken from the same report, but this covered a recent Blind Eagle campaign that um, used Quasar Rat, which is a open source rat. You can get it you know, on our public repo. But the group actually added a custom functionality. The name of this functionality is Activar RDP in English, or in Spanish. In English, it's Activate RDP, right? So, hmm, that's interesting for us, right? Nowhere in this report does it say Blind Eagle then RDPs into the victim environment. However, why would the heck would they add this functionality if they weren't intent on using it? So from this, there's implicit evidence, there's an inference that we can make that Blind Eagle has this capability and we would use that to fill in an information gap if the dev team came back to us and said, okay, we need another technique, what can we do? So. Now we've gathered our research, we have our adversary, it's time to create the plan and deliver it to the dev team. Just so we're clear, at this point in the process, the dev team's already in the loop. Blue team's also in the loop. The infrastructure team's also in the loop. Um, we really need those early collaborative processes to inform whatever plan we end up picking. So I'm gonna go over three key deliverables that the CTI team makes to inform the dev process. So we'll start with my favorite. This is my favorite thing to create. Not only is it pretty, but it's extremely, extremely helpful, right? This shows an overview of our emulation plan and what we actually did with Blind Eagle. At a really, really high level, the first stage, the attackers will gain initial access into the victim workstation via spear phishing. The user will then open up a PDF that is embedded in, that is included in the email. Clicking a link inside said PDF will take them to a malicious site where they will download an async rat payload. That's our main payload. Async rat will establish communications with the C2 server, establish persistence via the user startup folder, and then action on objectives is to steal browser credentials. This was the original plan. This does not mean that this is the end plan, so we're clear, because dev team loves trashing CTI plans for a reason, not intentionally. We'll call it element of surprise. <laughs> so this is another example of a deliverable. This is essentially the word version of what we just talked about with the software flow, right? So this is something that can kind of help the dev team, okay, so we have the software flow diagram, but let's dig deeper. What's the key infrastructure involved? Um, Kat's gonna go over this a little bit from the dev perspective, like when a dev gets something like this and they're looking ex for initial compromise, what is happening, what do they need, what questions do they need answered? And then a third example of this, we actually took this and you know made it our own from Mandiant and Katie Nichols, so shout out to them. 
Um, this is something that we would expect the dev team to use during the actual attack, right? This provides um, different pivot points and alternative options at each major st step of the attack lifecycle, right? So, okay, my scheduled task didn't run, whatever, tools break, we get it. What is my alternative option while still maintaining the integrity of what the adversary would actually do? Cool, okay, they do registry run keys. Let's do that instead. Just a note, if you're wondering, wow, Kat and Kate, this is such a sparse diagram. You're correct. <laughs> That's called open source reporting. Please help us encourage people to write more blogs and reporting on this specific issue. Right? Yeah, this is us like trying. This is our peak right here, so. <laughs> Slightly depressing, you are correct. Okay, cool. Now I'll hand it over to Kat to talk about the dev side. All right, so we just went over choosing a villain, right? Kate went over like what actually makes a good villain for you and your organization. And then we went over essentially like what those deliverables look like. For us on the dev team, those deliverables that the CTI gives us are super pivotal. That's actually really where we come at the collaboration point. Um, so we're gonna walk through the unsex, like sorry, here's the funny thing. Malware development, if you take away the malware, it's still just development. <laughs> And so that's the reality of what we're gonna actually go through. So before you even begin, in that early stage of collaboration that Kate mentioned, right, where she was like, yeah, we bring the, the dev team in at this time. A lot of times when she's coming up with that emulation plan, like what the red team is doing is that we're actually on those calls. We probably are doing other work at the time, like everybody else is on three different calls, but we're absolutely like involved in those conversations. And the reason why that's significant is because I can't do everything. My team can't do every single random thing under the sun that an adversary does, right? Again, it's a nation state versus a team of 10 developers, and the time is cut down significantly. There's a lot of randomness that's done out there, right? So first we have to know like, what platform are we even running on? Is this Windows, is this Android? Like we actually scratched Android in the beginning. She's like, well, could we do Android? It's like, no. I will not learn Android just for this presentation. Tears were shed. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's a part of the scoping, right? Like what platforms do I need? What um, code do I need to be able to run in? Like what level are we playing at? Are we playing at kernel level or are we playing in user land? Because that makes a huge difference. Are we all down to the bits and bytes? Like where do they focus on? Do they focus on the network protocols, right? Like these are all different skill sets that I need to make sure the team has and is staffed appropriately. And so, once we have a lot of those key factors done, um, that's super helpful. I will call out this last one. You know how Kate mentioned in that other slide on Blind Eagle, these are the things that we really want to emulate. So we had this scenario for one round where we lost 64% of our team. <laughs> that is a lot. And the CTI diagram, like this, that great CTI plan, totally had to get revamped. And then we had, like, we didn't ask that question in the beginning of what, what actually makes this actor look like this actor. Like, what are the techniques that have to be done to make this look like Blind Eagle? And so those become the priority, that if we stripped out everything else, it still feel like Blind Eagle with this. And that is actually our definition of done. It might seem like it's kind of a small, logical thing, but there's a lot of stuff you actually don't need that's really nice. Like encryption and obfuscation are great, but honestly, they're not really relevant for our scenario. The behaviors are much, much more relevant for us. And those are, if you remember from the Blind Eagle side, those three TTPs that we handed over to the dev team, like if nothing else, we would really love to emulate these because these are quintessential for the actor, but also, again, something that network defenders should absolutely be detecting on and should be challenged to detect on. Um, those are kind of, would be returned as priorities to the dev team mm. when they're making these calls. So again, we take that next product, right? The emulation. And then the most and the most helpful for us is actually the word picture. The diagram's great, but there's a lot of assumptions that we all make when we're looking at diagrams. Diagrams for, at least for me as a dev, they're really great when I need to come up for air. And I'm like, okay, where am I at in this scenario? Like, wh like what is next and what did I just do? Like what am I expected to have done and then what am I expected to do next, right? But when you actually like are looking at this in the beginning, it's like, all right, let me read this out. And the most specific point, oh, that got loud, um, is to a malicious site downloads async graph, right? That means that I need to have a website. Well, what's gonna be on the website? 
How does it download it? How does it even know that I'm there to download it? What does that even look like? Is it a URL to a URL? Is it some JavaScript stuff? That's all dev time that I have to account for. In fact, it's also infrastructure time that I have to account for. I need to be able to upload something, right? I need to be able to download something. Where is this going to be hosted? How is it going to be hosted? All of those questions I have to have done before I even play in like, the other games, right, in the, other, the next phase. Um, so this is usually where we'll actually go through, specifically look through the word picture and be like, what is it that I need? And what teams do I need to bring in at what point in time? And then the super sexy part. We use Jira. I really don't care what you use. But there has to be something where you kind of start breaking things down and scoping. For us, we usually like have a couple of epics. Um, those epics, whoever does those epics, is usually one person because the amount of the rabbit holing that has to happen during that period of time is insane. Like your brain just hurts at the end of the day. It's usually a sign of success. Um, and it's where we take one epic, right? Like let's say I'm going to focus on the C2 handler just because they just did one. Um, I'm going to look at, like, okay, let me take all of the reporting from that emulation plan. Let me pull that down. Let me look at it. But I'm only going to scope that specifically to what protocol does it use? How does it have the buffer? Like, how does it receive the buffers? What is it looking for? How does my C2 know that that's my packet? Right? Like, there's these questions that I have to ask myself. And then I start looking at it with that very, very, very specific mindset. And then that becomes my epic. And I actually break that down. For example, just because an implant has the capability to do something doesn't mean I need it for my emulation plan. It's a ton of work to go into uploading and downloading a file for a command in the very specific annoying way that the adversary does it in this obfuscated fashion. If I don't need it, why am I going to do all that dev time? And that's where that epic comes in handy, right? Like, what's actually needed for the emulation plan? Not what's super cool and what's nice to have, but what's actually needed. And then we take that epic and then we break that down into specific tasks. Because attack evaluations is very, very specific on being true to the adversary, and actually we're held accountable. Like here, at EDR, like or here, at protections and detections products. Like with your unique Snowflake solution, here is exactly how we're doing it. We have to break down that code really, really specific, and it needs a lot of focus on it. So we'll take like process hollowing. We'll really focus exactly how they do process hollowing, and then try to recreate that. Because at the end of the day, the rest of the code is just to get to the technique. Right, because that's what we're supposed to be emulating for the detections and protections. Like that's the goal. Okay. So, this is Cat's crazy, chaotic rabbit hole brain in a process. <laughs> Turns out there is a process to the rabbit hole. Um, this is kind of how I've broken it down, um, mainly because I'm hoping that this helps somebody else in the future. I'm one of those people that like diagrams, so I don't feel completely lost. It's like, oh no, I'm not crazy. I'm just at this phase. <laughs> it's normal to feel crazy at this phase, right? So essentially where it starts is on any task that I'm given, right? Because I can't know how to do all of the 400 sub-techniques. I take one technique, and then I try to understand it. There's something really powerful about seeking to understand without the assumption that I should already know how to do this. So I try to understand the technique. And then it goes into like, all right, let's look at the code snippets. Let's look at the diagrams. Let's look at like that crazy eye chart diagram is phenomenal. Because the more, like, I can't I look at that thing so many times, and I'm still understanding it in different ways. So awesome reporting. Um, but the point is, is like I take that and I start breaking that down. Then the next phase is actually emulating the code. Once you actually start coding something, it's a very different attitude. It's a very different approach. Why am I um, So then the next thing I do is um, essentially you're going to find gaps. Once you actually start emulating, you'll, you're going to find gaps. Things don't work like you expect them to do. Then you got to go back to the reporting and then figure out what else is happening. With this new knowledge set of trying it out, what is different? So, and then because we're taking something, right, and we're taking it and executing it in an environment it was never designed to execute in, that is its own phase of development. So it's almost like taking, hey, Batgirl, you only operate at night. Let's go shove you into the daytime and then like see how that works out for you. So things are just going to change because the reality is we have to put this into this agnostic environment and then make sure everyone can deploy their tools into it. So there is that element of component that maybe you guys don't have to go through, but we absolutely do. So this is what understanding looks like. We're going to start with MITRE ATT&CK because at the end of the day, MITRE ATT&CK is what this is based off of. And it's a great tool to be able to understand what is this technique actually about and what are the different variations of it. Then we were not just paid to say that, by the way. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> a thing. Um, and actually, the evals team, as much as like we all like have our own like inner team like jokes and like elbows, um, it's actually a really cool way to always make sure like, hey, we just did an emulation on this. This needs to be updated. 
But uh, the next thing that we do, right, understanding the technique, is we specifically look at how does the community do it? Because at the end of the day, there's something about hands-on keyboard that I'm going to get a lot of tribal knowledge from practicing this, even if it's not the way the adversary did it. If I've never done process injection before, I need to practice it. I need to understand what's going on. I need to understand what information do I need that actually to be able to accomplish this? What permissions do I need? There's just some things that you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So this leads us, right, once we understand what's happening, now I can actually go and research with a different level of perspective. Um, so that takes us to the diagrams and code snippets, right? Now I can go and look at that. In this scenario, um, we noticed that F uh, Society DLL was referenced twice, right? It's referenced in two different reports. So just a note of information, we're gonna put that aside. Another thing is we notice async rat, which we are using the simulation plan, is also in this repo. Now, great thing about infosecers, we love our, our proof of concept code. Downside is people reuse that for malicious means, but we're still super grateful because it really worked out for us in this scenario. So thank you. Um, so uh, we took F Society um, and we took this. So those are two data points for us to be able to go down on the next rabbit hole. And when it comes to adversary emulation, we are big fans of working smarter, not harder. We don't have a lot of time to be able to execute these. So as a result, uh, we try our best to be able to find other resources, right? We're not going to be REs. So how can we be able to pull these reports and coding that we can actually recreate? In this case, thank you, Alien Vault. Um, .NET actually goes to source code really easy, which is beautiful. So uh, we were able to actually take F Society, pull that down, and then be able to have decompiled code that we could then reference. Of course, when we do this, the first thing we actually have to do is be like, Kate, can we? I have so much power in this situation and I love it. And I would say, actually based on CTI reporting, this is absolutely consistent with what the adversary would realistically do. Cat, green light. So yeah, because once we kind of start noticing, and you'll notice the next one, they definitely, there's like some duct tape and bubble gum going on. <laughs> so we have our decompiled code. Now we can actually take that and then go to the next one. And then we'll actually notice that there, go ahead. Um, there's handle run, right? There's a handle run method inside of the decompiled code. And so what we can do is we can take like method names like that, and then we can actually search the other resources for that. Now what we're looking at is the decompiled code of F Society, right? That's their, specifically their process hollowing um, DLL that they use. So we go back to the repo and we find that, oh, in LineCryptor, they have a method also called run handle. Hmm, or handle run, sorry. Um, Actually, it's got the same parameters and the same logic. And then when you actually look at the code side by side, it's basically the same exact function, just with added functionality added into the decompiled version. So this tells us that a lot of the stuff is actually pulled from different points. And then you'll start to notice other patterns, right? Like the fact that they started using Lime Rat, right? And then you'll notice that there's a whole Lime theme to this repo. So that kind of tells us there's a lot more to the story. Like there's a lot more resources in here that we'll probably find that's leveraged inside of their code. So just notes for red teamers and emulation, like the, the patterns that you find as a result of emulating. And this is another good example of the conversation that would take place between the CTI team and the red team at this point, right? Like, hmm, Kate, seems like they're kind of copying and pasting from this very public repo. Any thoughts? I would say, yeah, the adversary is not known to create custom implants. They absolutely just go based off of what's already out there. So just wanted to call that out. So this is what it actually looks like specifically for process hollowing, right, for the difference between the two. Community method, you're going to be using your ZW query information process. It's going to give you back this beautiful little struct with a little pointer at the bottom saying like, hey, this is your base pointer address. However, that isn't, and like then you're going to go in, you're like, well, I really don't care what you're running there. You're going to run this now, next. Whereas the adversary's code does something different, right? It specifically calls read process memory, which gives you a buffer. Then it's going to do the get thread context, which is going to iterate through an array. It's going to find the base point address, plus eight. Math is hard, right? Like they're adding math into this equation. And then they're going to be like, OK, well, we're going to take what you're currently running. We're going to unmap it. And then we're going to be like, you should run this now, very kindly. And so it's an entirely different attitude, right, in the way that it's going about. Also, should be thrown out, way easier to detect as well. So if we were just doing process hollowing, it wouldn't get the same effect as if we were actually doing what our adversary is actually doing. 
Yeah, and just to add to that too, this again footstomps what we need to do as emulators versus what red team operators would realistically do. Like something might make a lot more sense to do or emulate, but the adversary didn't do it that way. Does it make our life harder sometimes? Yes, absolutely. Do we have a responsibility to the actor to really be undistinguishable from what we're doing versus what the adversary is doing? Yes. So that kind of comes with, with costs, as Kat's pointing out. So fun fact, then we tried to do persistence. And that did not go as planned. Our main developer on this, which is Corey Goodspeed, um, was up to like 11.30 and he's like, why, why is it running reg services exe, the legitimate binary? So what happens in this infection chain, right, is we have this VBS code, VBS code, is also, um, it then downloads three files. It downloads F-Society, which is this process hollowing like mechanism, Fiber, and then it also downloads async grep. Now, Fiber actually does some other functionality we'll get into a little bit, but F-Society specifically takes the async grep that's pulled down, pops it in the memory using process hollowing, and then you know executes it. But there is never an infected version, and, it, and process, sorry, it process hollows it, oh yeah, it injects it into the reg services exe. That's the, so that's the specific process that's running with async rat in it. But that is never, that infected version is never actually downloaded. So the way that async rat expects to be run is that if you have installed it, right, it's expecting an infected version of reg services exe to be on disk that it's going to be calling from its service. But there isn't one. And we were like, well, where, where is it? Then how does it install persistence? And which kind of led us down to the next rabbit hole, which is, turns out it never installs a service at all. That's not a thing. It actually, and I love what this one report says. It's like, it works. It is persistence. Like, I forgot what it's like. It's simple. It's like simple, but effective. But it, <laughs> but it is actually effectively creating persistence. So that initial VBS file that it gets, right? Like, it, you click on the link, you have the PDF. The PDF is actually masqueraded as a UUD. Yeah. Uh, all the, all the acronyms, UUE, um, that then decompresses a VBS code. That VBS code is actually then copied into the Windows temp folder. And then it just sits there. Um, but that VBS code is actually what pulls down all these other things, right, which we just talked about. The reason why this is significant is because what it actually does is it creates a link file in the user's startup folder that links back to that Windows temp VBS file. And then it actually redoes the entire like three payload infection chain all over again. So it never does this entire part of the diagram, which is like broken out in reporting, which was super surprising to us, but it was exactly what it did. And we actually found that in the fiber DLL that's downloaded, which is one of the files that are downloaded for it. And um, this is an example of like, you would never know this unless you tried to emulate this process, right? So this is not us calling out the reporting saying it was wrong, no. This is just our dev, our wonderful devs trying to emulate it and realizing, uh, actually you can't do it with, in the way that we thought it would. So Which it's a huge value add. <laughs> yeah, for real. The really cool note here is that this reporting was really based off of two reports, like the simulation. This shows you how well those reports were done. Because we were able to emulate to this degree and figure this out, that's awesome reporting. So mad props to the reporters that did this. So the difference between the community versus attack evaluations and solving these gaps, right? When you have reporting gaps, which we're gonna have, is you guys can go like to VX Underground and download a sample or Twitter or wherever else your fancy is. For us, we have like a month and a half we do not have the time. And quite frankly, most of us are not REs. And like, if we are REs, it's like because we have this weird hobby and it's definitely being leveraged. So what we usually have to do, because at the end of the day, again, we have to adhere to CTI, right? Not everyone is going to have those restrictions like we do. So we're like, well, where else is this represented in attack? You know, what other campaigns have they done? Which is usually a conversation point for us where it's like, okay, they don't install persistence in this way. Do we just go forward with this and then just own the fact that reporting says this, or do we like can we use the link file? And then that's going to be a conversation. Well, is there evidence that a link file has been used in any other campaign, right? So that's going to be the conversations that we have because at the end of the day, we'll have to be able to explain them in the public eye. 
So these are our deliverables. Um, really, like the big points of these deliverables is we give you essentially the documentation and source code, right? It sounds kind of common for a red teamer, but ours are very specifically written for the purpose of transparency and the purpose of you all being able to run them yourselves. So the documentation that we have, there's a very specific file called voice track. This is the exact track that is done during the emulation. So that means for you who, like, we have all of our code inside the adversary emulation library. So if you want to go through and you want to run all of this code yourself, like we have Wizard Spider, we have Sandworm, we have um, APT29, Fin7, all of these different groups, right? You should be able to just copy and paste these lines and be able to execute the emulation as we did. Um, that's kind of the point behind it. We wanted to be able to lower this bar as much as possible because, again, it's about transparency. You should be able to be like, okay, well, does the vendor detect against this in my environment now? Like, that's a really great question, right? So that's one way to use it. Another way that we found was really helpful was we actually started citing attack techniques in the actual source code. The reason why this is relevant is because when you have someone on the phone that's saying they're like, no, 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 I de detected this. And you're like, no, 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 that's not the right code. Just because you detected something doesn't mean it's the thing that you meant to detect on, right? So it's a really great conversation point because not everything is linked the exact same. And that essentially is our process. Um, so what we went over was we went over choosing the villain, going through that process, right, of actually selecting a villain that works for you. Um, then the dev process, translating all of that CTI information and then putting it into actual requirements developing those requirements, going down that rabbit hole, and then creating, like, where, where, what do you do when there's gaps? Like, how do you pivot on that, right? Like, what are the decision points? Um, and now we have a great demo. Why tell when you can show? OK, so I'm going to voice track through this. And this will be publicly released next week, so you can see this video for yourself if you want. Uh, we might need to resize it. You want me to pause? Mm-hmm. All right, give me one sec. Just play it again? Yep. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, just kidding. Take two. <laughs> okay, so like we said, initial access, spear phishing. The victim is going to open up a PDF attachment, click the link, and it will download a file from a Discord server. Classic Blind Eagle, it is zipped and password protected, but they provided the password, so kind of them. We will enter the password to open up the PDF, which is actually a UUE file. When the user double clicks, we have, yep, the async rat payload has a callback. Now, let's look at some of the files that made this happen, right? Uh, we will look at the VBS code in that Windows temp folder. That's what kicked it off. And we will parse through that. And now we will go into the link file, which Kat mentioned is used to establish the persistence. Um, we will verify that. And then let's check on the key logger and set it aside for later viewing. And now action on objectives. Async rat is going to look to dump the credentials from the user's edge browser. So we will go look on our password stores and yep, all right, we have the credentials necessary. So we are going to go to the site that is being visited by the user. Fun fact, we made this very convincing banking site. Uh, please, please respect the process. <laughs> and we are going to look to use those key locked credentials to gain admin access into this site. So we will copy and paste. We did not use admin admin as user and password. And then finally, we're going to check our keylogger to make sure it's working. Dun, 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 dun. It's working. Um, so I know that was kind of a very fast walkthrough, but hopefully that gave you some idea of what our end product looked like. Thank you. Oh, you guys are going to clap. Thanks. It does work. We play. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I could say it was easy, but it was not. <laughs> we absolutely recorded this. We were not going to do a live demo. <laughs> Shout out to our developer, Corey, because that was a lot of late nights. So some key takeaways. Um, the biggest point of this entire presentation was to provide transparency to you guys. 
And so if you have questions, we welcome them. But mostly we just wanted to give you all an opportunity of like what this looked like. Yeah, and second thing, which we've kind of foot stomped time and time again, this is our solution for breaking down the silos between CTI and Red Dev, as well as Blue Team, et cetera, um, for collaboration, right? But again, this is just a solution. You are totally able to, you know, find a solution, um, and we hope that this methodology was helpful for you. And last but not least, um, Something to kind of remember, it's really easy to be like, oh, well, you're attack evaluations, you test all these vendors and it's a big thing. Um, we started off as like a four man team. Like I came in a couple of years ago and I actually started up the CTI team. But before that we didn't even have a CTI team. It was like one person and it was only like 25% of their time. So a lot of this work was built on the shoulders of guys just kind of hot, hot patching it together. So it's become bigger because it's just iterated over the years. So a lot of the things that we just went over, like those indeliverables, those indeliverables were honestly like blood, sweat, and tears. Like that is a result of we've distilled down that this is the stuff that actually mattered because this is the stuff that we kept referring to. And everything else was nice, but it was extra. And so we're hoping that maybe like you guys can learn from our lessons so you don't have to go through that same pain. And fun announcement, our entire emulation plan for Blind Eagle, including the video, including all the code, we are going to release that on GitHub next week. So stay tuned. So yeah, and that is essentially it. Just a bunch of thank yous to the artists, to our general manager, and to our dev. Um, and just thank you guys so much for attending. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Questions mic are drop. welcome. Straight up mic drop. <laughs> On accident. <laughs> so you guys are welcome to ask any technical questions if you want to ask about the presentation or anything else. It's pretty much open. Also, we have a Batgirl t-shirt for anyone that actually asks the best question. It is a challenge, <laughs> hands down. The challenge flag has been thrown. Yeah, and hopefully this was helpful. Again, we kind of wanted this to just be relevant to the average end user. So again, if you, even if you don't even have an adversary emulation capability in your organizations, this can be done by just one user. If you want to pick and choose just a couple of different techniques that were emulated in one of our plans on GitHub publicly available, that's absolutely your right to do. Um, that was kind of our intent for this. You don't have to be a vendor just to take advantage of this process. And you know what, last but not least, um, we just went over process hollowing. Like take one technique, emulate it, and then pop it into an automated test, and then run that throughout like your quarterly annuals or whatever that is, to see if your detections are actually still up and running. It doesn't have to be this massive emulation plan. Like there's even micro emulations. 100%. Oh, yay, a question, thank you. Is this on? So when you were, um, demoing or talking about process hollowing and you're showing like here's here are ways that it could be done and mm. here's the way we actually have to do it do you in your reports account for or do you cover like here are ways that adversaries might um, you know shift their techniques over time like here's what we expect them to do next when this stops working uh, do you include that kind of information or um, you know kind of lead like, is it really so tightly contained that it's only that adversary? And if they change their technique or they, you know, the main guy dies and a new one steps in, like, mm. they have suddenly this different process, but other pieces are the same. Like, do you point out, like, where it would be easy for them to change or where it could be, um, you know, more effective to do something else? That's interesting. So more like forward looking, yeah. like here's capabilities yeah. we anticipate the adversary doing. Especially since you rely on data that's so old already. Right. Like, you know, your data is three or four years old. Well, this is what they did three or four years ago. We don't really know if they're doing that today, but we would envision, you know, here are the places that they would make the next logical steps based on what we've seen. Okay. I have to speak to that for sure. And then that's Go ahead, go ahead. If I was just a red teamer, absolutely. However, we have a technique scope. Like the point of evals 
is, so here's the th fun fact about evals, right? Every single vendor, you don't get to put your tiered system on evals and then test that. You have your baseline configuration. So whatever you provide us has to be freely available to your lowest tier. With that said, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So since our real goal on attack evaluations is to elevate the entire industry, trying to use that baseline and pushing it, that's one reason why we use old reporting. It's because there's no excuse not to detect against it, right? Exactly. But absolutely, if I was just doing a red teamer and I wasn't being like being held, like holding vendors accountable to this like technique, then I would absolutely go like, well, this is the genre of what they do between their development team. So could I suggest opening up either a part of the repo or you know some shared documentation where other people who are more familiar with the current techniques oh. could suggest and say, here's how things have changed over time or here's what we're seeing you know, this year. If it's based on publicly available information, you're speaking to my soul. Yes. That's like, this constraint that we have though, right? Like yes. everything, everything has to be backed up by a publicly available resource so that we're maintaining the integrity of, we're backing everything up by data. Like? According to the adversary. Data would be available, but you know, perhaps sanitized? Would yes. that be? So there's two ways to contribute. Okay. So for all of you that are like, like, so love your question. Um, I expect that shirt. Yeah, he just really wants the shirt. <laughs> he really wants the shirt. Um, there's a couple ways to contribute. Like I just started a contribution process publicly for Ocean Lotus, which is what we're doing for Mac OS emulation and the Avisa emulation library. For those of you that have seen that, we can talk about later. Um, but for attack evaluations, when we actually announce the actor and the technique scope, we actually also do like a call for information. And so with that said, like you guys have code snippets, IDA files, whatever it is, send them to our team. Like we love that stuff. And as long as like it's a credible source, we will absolutely love to incorporate that. Um, we do have to have, for the techniques that we hold vendors accountable to, we obviously do have to have that. Right. Um, but if it's contributed in, like that's a different conversation because we can have the conversation. And we'll probably loop you in with a lot more visibility on that too. And like if we can't do it, we'll tell, we'll do our best to tell you why. Cool. Thanks. So yeah, Thanks no, for thank the question. You. Great presentation. Thank you. I just just go over here. <laughs> just get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Cooped up in a hotel room for twenty four hours. <laughs> Other question? Yay. Oh, this might be a bit tall for me. Um, so. Based on the kind of life cycle that you mentioned, right, there is a lot of um, importance placed on the ex development of exploits, etc., which makes total sense. But if I'm thinking about a smaller shop or just, you know, a place with not, not many resources that is being targeted by these adversaries, maybe they don't have the resources to do exploit development. Whether they should or not, I think, is a different argument, but just to say they don't. So how do you, how do you balance, or what, what would you call, in a way, not being able to do that, would that be simulation at that point, or is there a way to still do it, and it be called emulation just because you know what they're doing? Okay, so exploit development is a very specific thing, right? Like you're talking about something that's breaking outside of a balance of something else, right? We do our best not to include, <laughs> I say this and I'm like, oh, I'm cringing. Uh, we do our best to try to stick to the minor attack techniques and attack evaluations, because those are the repeatable behaviors. Because at the end of the day, that's actually more helpful. Um, which, so that's kind of like where I would lean towards. I would actually lean towards not playing around in the exploit realm. Like we actually do a lot of hand, like there is hand waving in attack evaluations where it's like, and we're just gonna say the user clicked on the document. Because we're not gonna have a user sit there and go in and click on the document. Like that's just not gonna be a thing. And so we're just going to simulate, we're going to click on it, and we're going to execute it, and we're just going to say a user did that, right? Like, there's going to be certain hand wavy things, um, and that's usually where I would throw that out there, where it's like, what's the real value add of playing in the exploit land? And honestly, it's all of the stuff around the exploit that's more value add than it is the actual exploit. And that's why we focus on so much of the behaviors and attack versus the exploits. And the problem, too, with exploits from the perspective of CTI is since patches are rolled out relatively quickly, by the time we sit down to choose the adversary, create the plan, dev it, mm -hmm. I mean, that's like 
technically a year, right? By that time, the exploit and its patch are already irrelevant because adversaries have moved on to the next thing. And your question's super valid because we talk about this all the time as a team, the limitations of not doing exploits because that is absolutely what we're seeing in the wild. Adversaries do that all the time. Well-known adversaries do that all the time. But it's just, again, speaking to the constraints that our team is under, that is something that unfortunately we're not able to to really emulate. Value Does that add. make sense? Yes, thank you. Cool, yeah, thanks for the question. I love it, bring it. We're gonna say last question because we gotta get out of here, but go okay. ahead. I'll keep it short. Uh, my question is about attribution. So mm -hmm. once we correlate enough of these incidents, and we do have an idea of how many techniques are involved in a single, let's say, attack scenario. At what point are we confident that this is blind eagle that we're looking at in terms of attribution? Is there like a giveaway mm. technique sequence? Is there like a giveaway maybe technique um, temporal proximity or something like that that might give away that this is definitely the threat actor that we think uh, is, is attacking us here? That's a great question. We usually leave that to the analysts out there whose reporting we're consuming, right? So on the attack evaluations team, we don't do like attribution really. We're, because since everything again has to be backed up by solid data reporting, we, if people ever come up to us and say like, how did you know that that was that adversary? We say because of X, Y, and Z, right? That being said, we don't just take things at face value. We obviously, as analysts, there's a certain degree of analytical rigor that is expected of us to really understand just because an analyst is reporting that this was Blind Eagle doesn't mean that we don't question that all the time, right? Like, we need to know, for in order for reporting to be actionable for us, in order to for something like attribution to be actionable for us, we have to know how did this reporting come to be? Like, how did they get the information? Was it a honeypot? How did they even witness the attack? So there's certain elements that we have to look for and certain questions that we have to be that asking to be kind of skeptical um, in order to be confident that whatever emulation we create is absolutely reflective of the actor themselves. Um, for Blind Eagle, like we had a list of things that they are known to do. One of the things is they target Columbia-based users almost exclusively. Um, so they're really, really selective in geographical targeting. That's just an example of something that we know with reading reporting, okay, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Does that help answer your question? That definitely helps, but I, I remember you also said like you were prioritizing what techniques to, to evaluate in your emulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there like a way to figure out which techniques are definitely going to show up in a blind eagle uh, attack scenario? I mean, definitely checking out the attack page on blind eagle right. <laughs> now that I'm uh, promoting attack too hard. That's an excellent <laughs> question. So we pulled those three TTPs I listed, domain fronting, process hollowing, and abusive legitimate windows ex uh, utilities. Those are the three we called out, but only because those were really unique to the actor that we really wanted to emulate, that we really felt would add something to the end user and industry. That was us making the call, not necessarily saying, oh, because they did these three, they must be Blind Eagle. Does that make sense? I see. I see. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right, I appreciate you guys. Outstanding presentation. Thank you so much for the yeah. question. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a good rest of the conference. Very nice.